Hello there, and welcome to another Chit Chats with Git Cats. This one is number 28. Well, They're going on, by guys. very quickly. Live right now. Oh, and I can hear Thomas talking in my in my uh, in my headphones. So I'm going to throw it straight over to my guest, Mr. Thomas McRocklin. Hey, Thomas. Hello, look at me. I'm still putting the link on my swipe up on Instagram. So I'm like, ah. Good well, that's morning. perfectly well, fine. Not, it's, not so morning for you, right? That's right. It's a, it's ten to eight in the PM over here, and that's fine by me. I'd, oh. That's some difference, yeah. It's like what, uh, ten to eleven in the morning. So I'm just getting like started. I've only had one cup of tea. I haven't even had. I haven't even had a coffee yet. So um, yeah, I had a pretty late one last night as well. So. Why did you? <laughs> what have you been if I working? I fall off the chair. Just just shout a little bit in my ear, okay? No worries. No worries at all. <laughs> so you're just getting all your social media stuff out there. My... Yep. I'm I'll give you a second. And then I'm I'm good to go, man. Yeah. Can't Hit wait. that pace button, mate. I'm going to make myself comfortable. I'm going to. Get all cross-legged, ready to talk. I have a habit of doing that. When when I'm sitting mixing, and I'm sure it's probably really bad for our circulation, but when I'm sitting in my like studio chair, I'm like sitting in it cross-legged all the time for yep. hours, and I'm thinking, like, ah, this can't be good, but it's like the most comfortable way to, for me to sit and mix. Totally, totally. Well, you're actually seeing this view of me from my iMac, which I don't normally share with people, but... I'm sitting in my pajama pants, mate. I got my little uh, whiteboard, my little controller. <laughs> as well, so you know, got to keep the comfort level high, right? That's the thing. Totally, <laughs> I think that's the key. And, and as I was saying to you before, mate, I've, I've just found my comfort zone with doing these, and it's actually come about by going in unprepared and just whatever comes out. Yeah, I think just sometimes the funniest stories and in, in, in just directions take place when it's like unscripted, right? And I've, um, Absolutely. I've done a few kind of d- different types of interviews and seen uh, different approaches from different people. And um, yeah, it's, it's like, it's always probably a little bit more fun when, you know, there's a little bit of that kind of line by the seat of your pants uh, thing going on. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I was talking to, to uh, Jennifer Batten a couple of days ago and nice. she, had a, she had a dog on her lap and it okay. decided to do a big jump and took out the power cord and just ripped her whole laptop off it off its where it was sitting and just yeah. wiped it out. I didn't freak out. I was just nice. like, "That's the danger of live, isn't it?" Yeah, that's it. Exactly, man. Uh, yeah, it's um something at some point. You know, it's like it's one of those things. It's it for my setup right now. It's just it's huge. You know, I've got my amp set up over there, my pedal boards over there, my main computers over there. And that feeds into another audio interface into here, which goes into the MacBook, and then the cams are coming in on different capture cards. Uh, you know, because you know we we obviously want to have things like happy dancing on the screen, right? Well, oh, hang on, let me go so, to that so you can just do that again, mate. Oh, I had it on a split screen; we didn't quite see that. Oh, you know, just whatever. <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, you know got, yeah. got to have the horns and stuff. You know, um, cool. but there's just so much going on, so it's kind of inevitable. It's like something. It's going to go wrong at some point. And there Absolutely. we go. That has me done. So There we go. Hopefully people awesome. will find us. You, you're all over the Instagram thing, aren't you? Like, is that what you were posting to I, just then? Yeah, I was just putting the swipe up on Instagram. I, I love Instagram. It's The thing is with Instagram is it was the platform that suited me the most, you know, because to jump right into, like, my guitar playing history, I played a huge amount when I was a kid, did loads of touring and TV stuff and, you know, like, just did a lot. And then I fell out of all of that, you know, kind of by the time I was like 17 or 18, I'd stopped playing guitar. So many, many years later, I started getting back into guitar and Instagram was like such a, like, I didn't want to sit down and make a 45 minute long YouTube video. I wanted to like, just post these quick lick videos as I was practicing working out. So it just kind of went, you know, in hand with my routine at the time when I was like practicing for hours, I'd you know, stumble on a lick. I was like, okay, that's a cool lick. I'll do a quick um, snap of that. And then I kind of got a little bit like obsessed with the whole thing and start like getting into like video editing and doing all these kind of more crazy camera moves on camera, which kind of started off a, a sort of new Instagram genre, I guess. That looks then, really um, cool. That looks really cool. I have seen that. And i got to yeah, say, that's fun. where I, I found you again because I was familiar 
with you as a, as a youngster, as okay. we all were. Cool. And it wasn't until, yeah, I, I was on Instagram and something came up and I just went, oh my God, listen to him play now. He's back. He's back. <laughs> He's back. He's back. Oh, wow. So yeah. you said you well, said took, before that took, you said that you stopped playing altogether for a while. Yeah, I mean, I, I like went down to playing as little as ten minutes in two or three months. You know, so I played so little that all the essential mechanics and motors and dexterity and strength that was all gone. You know, it's like I'd pick up a guitar and it felt absolutely horrendous it felt really really bad wow. um yeah so i played like just next to nothing basically for about thick end of 20 years or so for quite quite a, quite a period i was producing and i was kind of doing stuff with music um you know kind of start off with um more production um and that led into like mastering and other stuff so i was kind of around music but just not taking a guitar at all you know yeah right you just completely burnt out do you think well um uh, i mean just to to kind of go back on how that whole thing kind of came about as in like just putting the guitar down i guess from such a young age i did so much um you know my first big break you know was when i opened up for ozzy osbourne when i was eight years old and from that point onwards I was doing TV stuff, you know, and back and forwards down to London. I'm, I'm based up in Newcastle, kind of one of the northern cities in the UK. So it, it started off back and forwards to London doing TV stuff, and then that kind of escalated in other stuff. And then by the time I was 11 or 12, I'd, I'd signed with Interscope Records, and I was touring with Joe Satriani. Steve Vai produced the album. So it's like there's this whirlwind of stuff happening. And it kind of got to the point, well, there was, there was two things it kind of got to the point where when I was coming back to the UK and just doing normal kid stuff, hanging out with friends, that started to become the fun stuff and going back on the road and doing all this other crazy stuff was suddenly less fun. And then at the same time, I really got into like rap and hip hop music. You know, my favorite moments, like if I was in the Interscope record, uh, Interscope records um, offices in LA, they also had like death row records, so I would I would always get much more of a buzz by seeing one of my favorite rappers in the building compared really? to like, oh there's a, yeah yeah because that that was my you know, by the time I was like 13 14, I wasn't really listening to any guitar music anymore very very little I was mostly listening to like rap and hip hop. Wow. So I'd always get more of a kick about seeing guys you know that I was like listening to I was like oh look, you know, um. So to, to kind of summarize on that, basically, by the time I was like 16, 17, I'd got my first sampler. Mm -hmm. And once I had that Akai sampler and then a Korg workstation, that was it. It was like overnight, the guitar became secondary and then it got pushed to the back. And back then, you know, we're talking like mid early to mid 90s then at this point, there was no real cool way of integrating guitars with electronic music it was like a complete hack around it you know you could maybe record your guitar or sample as a loop but it wasn't like a natural thing now we have you know i use ableton um so it's like you want a guitar okay no problem let's let's get this guitar tone And just record it, blend it, do whatever you like. But back then, it was it was like that wasn't the case. Yep. So the guitar just got pushed back and back and back and back and back until eventually I was just like just mixing a lot of my own electronic music. But then I started to do that for other people as well, and that's where things changed again because suddenly, between making my own electronic music, by this point it kind of moved up a gear into like drum and bass and um, break beat jungle sort of stuff out that, that was like my the next thing i really got into and i was producing other people and then later i became a mastering engineer and there was just like there was just never the guitar the guitar was just never in the picture during these this periods which went on for many many years yeah man this all just sounds so familiar you could be telling my story right now 
around the same time. I almost asked you, <laughs> at what time did you stop playing and everything? And yeah, mid-90s, yeah. I went exactly down that rabbit hole. The turning point for me was seeing Nine Inch really? Nails live. I, I saw them live at a, at a festival yeah. and they came out and it was an outdoor gig and they had all these big bands on before them. And they all sounded like an outdoor gig and Nine Inch Nails came on and it just sounded like a huge stereo playing and just with all the samples and everything. And that led me down that rabbit yeah. hole. And the same, I very rarely played much guitar except for when I was writing or, yeah, I was doing the production for everyone. So it all sounds very familiar. Very familiar. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can blame the Akai samplers and that, that's it. Or, or and, maybe EMU and Sonic. sampler. You know, and Sonic which, for me. Which, 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 and Sonic, yeah, and there Sonic. we go. That's a yeah. Band. Mm. Yeah. Are they still yeah. doing stuff? I don't think they are. I remember. I yeah. 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 Akai, Emu, and Sonic, yeah. Yep. Yep. No, I was <laughs> yeah, in Sonic guy. So, Thomas, you, you mentioned, right. like, uh, opening for Aussie at, at the age of eight. And, um, yeah, everybody knows you were the, the child star. I remember you in the Ibanez ads and everything. And then uh, <laughs> being on the Steve Vai film clips. Do you remember a time when you didn't play guitar? No, no. No. I mean, I, st I, I started playing the guitar when I was four. And... You know, it was my dad's guitar. He always had a guitar in the house. So as soon as I could kind of pick up a guitar and, you know, he used to always keep it behind the TV and he'd go to work and I'd pull it out. And even when I was like tiny, I'd be like playing on the strings and stuff. Um, and I have a, you know, even from a very young age, I have a really obsessive personality. So, you know, when I, by the time I was like seven and eight, I was already playing 10 hours a day. You know, that was it. I was just wow. obsessed. In guitar there was nothing else very little distractions back then you know you know i remember when nintendo came on the scene suddenly i was like pumping some hours in it into nintendo stuff but no i can't i can't remember a time where i wasn't around guitars or into them or playing them you know or looking at the back of guitar magazines and seeing some of my favorite guitars and stuff you know watching david lee roth videos all of that stuff yeah <laughs> Absolutely. So you said you, your dad played. Did he show you much at the beginning? Was, was he your teacher? Or yeah. Yep. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, I mean, he was into guitar enough to. I mean, basically, he used to listen to like Led Zeppelin and Ozzy and Van Halen, and that was my thing as well. So we we kind of go cruising together. He was into that type of music enough that it would warrant having a guitar around the house. Yep. He wasn't like a shredder or a virtuoso or anything like that. Funnily enough, though, his name is John, John McLaughlin, which is like, it was hilarious when we'd go to the States because everybody would be like, oh, it's John McLaughlin, a.k.a. the famous jazz guitarist yeah. um, with his son Thomas McLaughlin, this other guitarist. And then it would always take him a while to figure out that he wasn't that John McLaughlin. But it was always funny initially, like seeing that you know, kind of reaction on their face when it would be like, okay, John McLaughlin's here now. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, he, he kind of taught me my first uh, chords and chord changes. Thin Lizzy, the boys are back in town, you know, when, when I kind of got that chord change. I think that was like a defining moment, actually, you know, because, you know, at some point, every guitarist, they pick up a guitar and it's like they play something that makes sense or it's recognizable. It's like, oh, there we go. It's 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 happening now. I'm on the way, you know. So yeah. I kind of, I'm pretty sure I still remember that moment sitting on the couch and then the chord chains. You know, it was in time with the music, and that was a big thing. Just moving those power chords around. It's like, wow, okay, and that began the spark of everything, I guess. Cool, cool, and what a great way yeah. to get into it, huh? So when I saw you playing as a seven-year-old on TV and stuff, you were. You had all the Van Halen stuff down, the, the tapping and that. <laughs> Did your dad pass that on to you, or was that just something that you watched on TV and thought, oh, I can see what he's doing there? Yeah, no, that was just me watching like Hot Licks, um, you know, David Lee Roth videos and anything else that I could get at that time. Um, my dad definitely wasn't a tapper or a shredder, you know. He, he used to always say, like, um, you, you know, he just didn't have the this sort of finger speed for it. Um, so luckily, uh, my granddad was like actually a really great accordion player. So he thinks I got my granddad's genes from like the, the playing side of things. Wow. Um, but no, he wasn't like 
you know, it was really difficult actually because uh, in the northeast of the UK, there wasn't really like a huge. I mean, there's guitar stores and stuff, but there just wasn't the resources or the teachers to kind of, you know, kind of instill a lot of that stuff that I was into. Um, and you'd always try and, you know, drive me for miles to try and find a teacher that would be able to to bring something to the table. And he was always kind of like that, you know, even when we go to L.A., you try and find these amazing guys, you know. So that led to me sitting down with people like Ted Green. And I used to, you know, my bedtime reading material was reading Ted Green's uh, chord books. And they were just like absolutely immense, you know, and it's like that that would be like my bedtime stuff right there. Wow. Um, so he's he was always keen on like hunting out and find these guys. But in the UK, in Newcastle, we couldn't really get that so much. And we tried a few different teachers and it didn't, it didn't really work out. And bear in mind, like at this point, my progression is like just going up rapidly. So that caused an even bigger problem. But one kind of really cool thing that came out of it, he found um, a really great classical teacher um, and a theory teacher. So that was like a really cool Thing that really those those lessons really stuck with me from like even till right now they're in my plane you know the classical stuff was like fantastic even though it was quite strict and sometimes you know i'd knock on the guy's door and not actually press the doorbell because i didn't want to go in that day because he was a hard ass yeah yeah <laughs> but like you know he, he taught me a lot of theory the technique and and a lot of stuff that would be really useful in my electric plane mm-hmm. and from my theory lessons with another guy uh, combined with the classical lessons that really helped to just make the playground sorry make the fretboard more like a playground it kind of opened up everything um which was a great thing and like i say kind of that has been a big part of my playing ever since so okay so no no real electric guitar lessons i guess but lessons with classical and theory and you know just try and soak things up where possible did you start out on, on a full size guitar, or did you have something smaller that you could play on? No, straight to full size. Even when I was four and five, you know, um, yep. that was it. You know, the the only guitar that I ever had um, that was slightly smaller was one of the custom guitars that Ibanez made for me, which was a full size guitar, full size neck, like a twenty five point five scale. Um, but they shaved the body down a little bit, okay. which made it really cool because the body ended up being like this sort of size. Um, so super cool. Awesome. But no, it was always like straight to full size, you know. Yep. So you said that uh, the classical lessons really helped you with your approach to the fretboard. Mm. Man, that's something I struggle with. I have times away from the guitar because of tendonitis and things like that, and so I probably won't touch it for a couple of months. And I come back, and my knowledge of the fretboard, I've got my little pentatonic shape oh we're in a minor i'm going to play at the fifth fret and anything <laughs> yeah. outside of that i got to think about it for a couple of days and get that knowledge back in but did that because you took it up yeah. so young is it completely yeah. ingrained in you that you just look at it as one whole thing never goes away never yeah. goes away I, and, and actually i never think about theory well i think about very little you know when i'm playing i'm always interested in reacting to what i hear um but behind all of that is the the layers of theory which are just sitting there um so a lot of people might have a thinking process like they hear a chord and they go okay um i'm gonna go for some mixolydian type of sounds um and it's just like this layers of thinking that you just for me you just want to remove because for me i always love jamming and improvising and that was like probably one of my greatest skills the fact that even though when I, that, was, that i was like a little dude I could go on a lot of stages and just jam with people. Um, so even when we had like, you know, the Jason Becker um, benefit concert, um, I was playing with Zach Wilde and um, Steve Luthiker and myself and a couple of others. And we had this like massive jam session. Um, and it was like totally a comfortable thing where some people, they kind of crumble in a jam situation and they are fantastic at kind of repetition type playing. Mm-hmm. Um, but so for me, yeah, it's kind of, I I don't I just don't have that issue, uh, thankfully, and um, I but I loved passing that stuff on, you know. Um, so recently we put a lesson out on my school how to unlock well unlocking the fretboard, and the feedback on that has been like 
absolutely crazy. Like we get so many messages and emails about that particular lesson. Wow. It's unreal. So it. <laughs> you said uh, starting off that young and being able to pick up things. I hear that it's a lot easier to, de- to develop perfect pitch at a young age. Do, do you have perfect pitch? Can you, do you have note recognition? Like, can you go, oh, yeah, it's an A. Yeah, it's a I mean, what, what, I, what I would actually practice quite a lot because I hear the notes before I play them. And now probably a lot of that is because, you know, you play that much, you, you know exactly how it's going to sound. But, for example, you know, if I, if I hear, like, an E or a G sharp, um, you know, one thing you can do is, like, maybe a lot of people do this. I don't think it's anything special. So, so if you hear the notes before you can play them, not my singing voice is probably terrible. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. But like, you know, you, you hear the notes exactly. So that way you don't have any surprises because what you don't want when you're playing is this feeling sort of thing. So like, you know, if, you, if you've got some distortion on, you're in D and the, the chords are like... <laughs> and you're kind of going for like a pentatonic thing. <laughs> what you don't really want to do is like have this situation where you're like going okay is this going to be a good note right here Uh kind of feeling around and moving it around and stuff yep so like so you just want to have like the confidence that you're going to deliver something and you know exactly how it's going to sound the split second before you play it With me, I kind of, I love bending the rules and I have tons of chromatic in my playing and obviously chromatic, you know, it doesn't belong always to a certain key. Mm-hmm. So I love like taking notes that don't belong to a natural key and kind of phrasing them in because um, phrasing is like a huge part of, of my playing. So I love kind of doing quirky stuff, but making it sound like note choices that shouldn't work but making them sound really cool. I, I love doing that stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you, you were very lucky in that you had Steve Vai as a mentor from a very young age. What type of things did he instill into your playing that you're aware of and you go, I got that from Steve, or, or just lessons? Um, sure, sure. It's very interesting because all the, the time that I was around Steve and living with Steve, he wasn't really playing and the, the times that we'd play together tended to be more on stage, you know? So for example, um, a couple of times me, Steve and Joe Satriani were on stage together and it was because we were all in the same city at the same time, uh, or Joe would be playing and Steve would be in town and, you know, I'd go down and three of us would play. So that was like the times that we played together on stage, is the, the times that we played together the most. So we didn't really sit down and play. In fact, during the recording process, during you know, the sort of tracking and mixing of the, the Bad For Good record that Steve produced, Steve actually himself wasn't playing at all. I think he had about six months off from even picking up a guitar. Wow. Um, so you'd very rarely see Steve picking up a guitar at that time. And you know, I remember, I remember that at the end of it, you'd kind of start to go up to the vault where all his guitars and sort of extra gear was and uh, he started to kind of get back into playing and practicing again so the stuff that i took from steve often um was something that i was even more interested in though which was like the production side of things you know i love being in the studio and being around the you know the gear and the console and steve was like he's always been a gear nut you know so he had a company called light without heat which was like a rental a gear rental company um and there was just tons of gear everywhere. There was tons of gear in the mothership. There's all these different amps coming and going from different brands that wanted probably need to check it all out. Um, but he explained like the mixing console in a way that kind of makes sense, you know. So you know, sitting at a big mixing desk for a, for a young kid, like like what, what does all this do, you know? Um, so you know, I even remember like he explained the bus system, how all of that worked, in a way that kind of made total sense. Um, so obviously. At a young age, Steve, you know, as a player was like definitely an influence on my first cycle um, of playing, you know, Um, 
now I play really different to how I play as a sort of kid slash teenager. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, how there, there was a couple of tracking situations where we were tracking rhythm guitars and there was a sort of one part that he was showing me like he wanted to have this certain effect on it, which was like whipping the strings really fast. Um, and at that time, I was using two mil um, picks. When I was whipping him, it was really like it would often kind of pull the tuning out or be the wrong technique. So we kind of learned, you know, how to do that for a certain part. And he, he kind of picked up the guitar up and showed me that. And that was one of the few times that you kind of, we had that kind of one-on-one, almost like a lesson type of situation because most of it was like tracking and then going out on Hollywood Boulevard and having pizza and watching movies and hanging out, you know? Yeah. One thing that I did notice, um, it was a few years ago I stumbled on uh, the True Fire website and there was about five hours of instruction from Steve on there and, and I, I paid to watch that and a friend of mine sat in on that um, and he didn't – at the start he said, if you're here to learn about scales and all that kind of thing, there's a million people that can teach that better than I can. If you come here to learn more about the, the mindset and the philosophy, then – stick around let's talk yeah. and that's one thing i've noticed just from his live streams recently as well he's all about that the mindset yeah. of things that the zen of it all um is that what you picked up from him as well a lot of that stuff yeah i think we're probably very similar in that way obviously he went through you know things like working with zappa and there would have been a ton of theory and just He's handed stuff on paper and you'd have to recite it and learn it and play it exactly, you know. So he, put, he obviously had that upbringing that he had lots and lots of theory installed. But I, I think ultimately he's probably similar to me in that sense that we, we don't think of it too much at the forefront. We kind of play on reaction and emotion and approach, phrasing and stuff. So I guess in that sense we're probably quite similar. Um, you know, I, I'm much more interested in a great vibe of a solo and something that resolves really nicely than something that is perfect and has tons of, you know, flashy techniques in it. It's Mm -hmm. great to pull on those things, but it's much cooler to have like a phrase, a a solo that's just phrased wonderfully. And it just like, it speaks a lot, you know, and and with my band, uh, McLaughlin and Hutch, because we don't, we don't really have a vocalist. We have some tracks that feature vocals, but predominantly it's instrument, instrumental music. So the guitars in that role have to take on like a vocal-like delivery. So it's really super important that it doesn't turn into like three, four minute shred tracks, which it could easily be. And it's like you listen to it and everything kind of has lines and questions and answers and it's just more melodic. And then obviously we have those big flashy moments where everything goes crazy but for the most part you can put it on your car and just cruise to it you know <laughs> yeah yeah i think that really sets apart I, I did buy your solo album uh forgive me for not remembering oh, cool, the name of you. it uh about two years ago or something i think it came out oh new beginnings yeah new, new beginnings, beginnings. Yeah, yeah yeah yep and yeah i was just had that on high rotation for a while i loved it and then oh, i wow, saw you, you start to um put out a few little flashy promos for the uh, McLaughlin and Hutch, uh, McLaughlin yeah. and Hutch, sorry. And what struck me about that straight away was the, the 80s vibe and the, 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 the synth, synth bass type of thing, which is, I love that, yeah. that quantized do, 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 do kind of sound. And um, yeah. So is explain the, the McLaughlin and Hutch, who, who, is, who is Hutch in that situation? Is he the, the synth guy? Yeah. Or, yep. Yeah, for sure. So, um, McRockle and Hutch, I mean, we started doing stuff a couple of years ago now. Hutch, Tim Hutchinson, is somebody that I used to uh, master his tracks for. Oh, cool. And he's a, a fantastic electronic producer, and he's just super prolific. And he'd send the tracks over to me whilst I was kind of in uh, mastering mode. Um, and I knew him longer than the the time where he was doing electronic music i remember back in the day because he's he's always been a fantastic guitarist and he's from my local area so we would cross paths like over the years you know in different studios you know different settings and you know we we, we knew, we've known each other for a long time um 
and he's known what I've been doing, and you know he's he's sending tracks over, but we've just never until recently kind of got together and, and put something to you know to fruition. So he kind of got into synthwave about the same time uh, as me, I guess, and. A, a year or so ago, I did a track with Gunship, um, who were one of my favorite um, synthwave bands, and I really love their stuff. And lucky, I was lucky enough to do a solo on one of their tracks, and it turned out great. And it was just so much fun um, as a genre because you know we we really pull heavily from the '80s vibe, and that's where me and Tim were like really listening to like all of the '80s shred players, but also you know that sort of synth side of things as well. So. So it's been really fun to kind of put that together and we've already kind of sort of dancing in around uh, different subgenres, and the, the last couple of tracks have been a little bit heavier um, and a little bit more riff based but we are still kind of continue to keep that 80s retro theme. Um, so I think because me and Tim were like a similar age and we've both kind of, you know, we have such fond memories of that era. Um, so to kind of draw on that, and it just so happens to be a great genre for like shredding over. It's just it's just been a lot of fun, and uh, the reactions to the tracks have been great. And now also because Tim typically has been doing, you know, the music side of things, and he sends it over to me, and I put my guitar side of things down and finish off in the production and mastering, and then we we kind of go back and forth like that. Because Tim's also an awesome shredder, now we will bring Tim into the, the sort of shred scene as well. So um, I think, you know, obviously there's no gigs right now. You know, it's like maybe we can do online gigs. Uh -huh. But we, we, not so long ago, we toured with Dragon Force. And, um, you know, it was a great experience. And we, we learned a lot. And we, we weren't even at this stage thinking about doing touring and gigging and stuff, you know. But we got asked to do the tour. And it was just like it turned out to be like really, really cool. Um, but we kind of just had like, we were just, the best part about it was like all of the stuff that we learned that we'd like to do in the future. So just do like extra fun things, bringing Tim onto the shred, you know, throw my guitar to him and do all this kind of fun stuff. Um, so on the sort of back of that, that kind of led to the kind of future, uh, version of McRockland Hutch, which is starting to come through now with tracks like Italian Disco and Black Lime, which are much more aggressive and they feature more and more guitars but again it's not like a shred fast it's just fun stuff you can listen in the car and have fun with it you know but yeah so me and tim um we're still working together we've got a bunch of tracks in the pipeline we just finished off another one of the last day or so and yeah it's a lot of fun man nice nice it's good to find somebody like that that you can work with then huh and and just have such cool music come Surely. out yeah so yeah no, you mentioned the whole sure. shred thing um and one thing that really impresses me about you is there's a million guys out there that can shred and most of them cannot compose a decent melody to save their life mm -hmm. because they've spent so much yeah. time woodshedding that stuff that they forget the stuff that matters yet you mm -hmm. from what i hear in your playing will play beautiful melodies with that what i like to call liquid in between that 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 joins it you know it's like and it's very um, reminiscent of string lines from back in the, in the 70s and 80s TV shows, I, I think, all those, blah, 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 yeah. I was just going to go there, <laughs> but now I'm going to go, blah, 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 yeah. Blah. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. in terms of melody, melodic players, um, who are some of the influences that, that have really um, put that into your head? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because, like... I used to love guys like Django Reinhardt, uh, Chet Atkins, Danny Garten, and I, I obviously listened to Satriani, Steve Vai, Randy Rhodes. Those were my three guys until I hit like nine or ten. And by time, you know, we started going to the U.S. and you know, cruising around in the car with my dad in the U.S. Then we start listening to like Danny Garten and and all these other Roy B. Cannons and all these you know different guys like that more blue stuff, some more jazzy sort of stuff. Um, and then I, I you know, would listen to some classical stuff between that. So I guess a lot of that stuff, from a melodic point of view, um, 